I didn't recognize it because the, the, the name was changed by the publisher oh. to be avian dances which it wasn't it was all about bird song and the relationship of song and getting people to listen pay attention um when they're outside and and uh and they wouldn't have didn't have cover notes either so when you played the piece it didn't sound anything like a dance whatsoever but they the publisher chose dances so it would sell better you know but it, it, when i talked to some people that did play it they didn't, they didn't understand what the music was. And when I explained about the birds and, and the spring migration and all that, then it, then it made sense the second oh, time that they played it. But the publisher kind of totally missed the boat on that, on that one. So it's, I think, gone into yeah. obscurity, you know. But <laughs> um, yeah, that, that's so frustrating. Yeah. Maybe uh, in the contract after 10 years, you can go somewhere else or something. Well, it's, it's not, you know, I don't own it. I mean, we have it, but it, we just commissioned it. Yeah. So the composer has it, but that's how it is in the world sometimes. Yeah. So. <laughs> and I would have been happy to write something, you know, if, if I'd known, you know, for the cover. But, well, this is going to be really exciting, sir. And um, I turned them on. We used to uh, tag them at the school I was at. And I remember the days we get a dozen in the net at once. We easily do. I think we got over 50 back from Mexico in the, in the years, but uh, uh, certainly butterflies are a passion of mine and is any kind of nature is all of us on our Audubon are. We're not just about birds in our group oh. for, for sure. But uh, so I think we can get started here. Um, so welcome. Um, if you haven't already, like shut off your your sound. You could do that if you want to stop your video too. That might help you with your connections and stuff with uh, with us. Um, Francis tells us we have um, sixteen thousand one hundred twenty five dollars and eighty four cents in our account right now, and four hundred and fifty five dollars in the bird feed fund. And you're always welcome. Uh, Funds for the bird feed fund too. We can keep replenishing that because we'll go through that in short order here during the during the winter time. Of that money we have in our account, we have at least ten thousand are are earmarked for projects. Tomorrow we have a meeting in three of our counties with the state avian biologist um, Anna Buckhart Thomas to look at these uh, modus uh, tracking towers. Um, that track birds, bats, and curious, and also can do butterflies, believe it or not, with these system of towers. It's a new thing for Iowa, and we're, our Audubon chapter is looking very closely into uh, supporting that research and uh, looking for sites that we can help fund um, one or two of these uh, towers to get started with. So we thank you for your uh, your donations, and we try to put it to good to good use, not only with our programs here, but um, with our outreach and, and helping our six six county region. So our local membership dues are are due now because they the fifteen dollar ones, which is dirt cheap for what we get out of your um, membership. It goes from January to. Uh, uh, December. And if we haven't heard from you for a while, we'll be sending out a, a note card just as a reminder. For a National Audubon Society, uh, it's $20 and you get the magazine. And that's renewed by the month when you signed up. So I found out like I am, mine are due in October. And actually, I am not a member right now and even being as president because they didn't send me any kind of renewal. I have no, no idea. So I called them up and I said, what is the deal here? How come I don't get a renewal notice? And, other, and others of you get six, eight hordes of them all the time. And you think I just renewed. How can I just get a renewal? When it is renewed, it takes about a month to, to get um, on our actual list. But I found out some, somewhere along the line that um, I was checked off for them as not receiving any kind of mail from Audubon 
National Audubon Society. So you have the option of, if you're getting a lot of mail from them, to call chapter services, and I'll give you the 800 number for that in a minute, and request. Either I don't wanna get any kind of mail, or I requested that I get one renewal notice a year and one solicitation a year. So you can limit the amount you wanna get from either none or to all kinds of them, if you need a lot of reminders. But here's the 800 number, and they can always help you with your questions about National Audubon or your membership. It's 1-800-542-2740. But either way, national or local memberships, we sure appreciate your support. And as you know, we don't really own property as such. We put our money and our efforts into education and back into the community. So what we've we been seeing lately, I, we uh, Lyle Mayer out by his place in Grundy County has had a snowy owl seen a, a few times now. And it's probably one hanging around in the area. Um, we've had a number of those in the state. Um, he also had a, a common red pole at his feeder the other day, and I'm hearing some more reports of those at feeders. I think Tom Moon had one, and um, there's some other places to be looking for red poles. They might be with um, goldfinches and on those kind of uh, thistle feeders or so, but be on the lookout for those. Uh, we're seeing red uh, rough-legged hawks out out in the countryside, <clears throat> bald eagles are, are building nests, bringing sticks. I heard of one that was blown over in our last big windstorm here in Hardin County, and the, the, the adults are busy building it right back up again. So it's good to know, and they'll be on a nest pretty soon. We asked, we're getting requests, has anybody seen a saw white owl yet? Not yet. We have people dead and checking in our normal areas, but it's not unusual for them to show up later in the month or even into February. Um, so we're still gonna be doing Zoom here for the next uh, couple of months, it looks like. We're still not able to get in our normal church facility. We're considering an outdoor a venue for, for May, but we haven't found a, a suitable site that we yet that we can use um, in our area here where we have um, electricity and shelter if we need it in case it rains. But um, if you have an idea about any of that, you know, about a, a place we could use out, outside, um, let me know, or let us know. And if you have ideas for programs you'd like to see, um, let us know about that too. So with that, be, be vaccinated if you haven't already. Um, a number of us, me included, have been vaccinated and still got COVID. I know of a couple of people in our group that, that have been vaccinated and got the booster and still got COVID. And, but you're a lot better off um, having a vaccination and then uh, risking serious illness or, or death. And we sure don't want to lose any of you out of our membership. So. Um, so with that, I'm really excited about our, our program tonight, and uh, I'm going to turn it over to Candace, who will introduce our speaker, and we'll get rolling here, and she may have a couple comments, too, about the logistics of uh, using the, the Zoom here, too, so Candace, take it away. Okay. Um, so I think everybody looks to be muted. And if you are experiencing some glitchiness with your internet, like Tom said, if you mute your camera um, and just hover at the bottom kind of right um, or left corner of the Zoom screen, you'll usually get your toolbar so you can turn off the video and mute yourself. That sometimes helps. Um, so otherwise, uh, we'll get started. But we're very pleased to have Sarah Dykeman here for um, our presentation tonight. Um, she is an author and uh, a trained researcher, field scientist, and she just returned back from Ecuador uh, doing some amphibian surveys, 
which was fun. We got to see a couple extra pictures of frogs. Um, but Sarah is the founder of beyondabook.org, which fosters lifelong learners, boundary pushers, explorers, and stewards. Sounds like she is a person of like mind to all of us. Um, like I said, she works in amphibian research and as an outdoor educator, guiding young people into nature so that they can delight in its complicated brilliance. She hopes her own adventures, and she's had many of them. Um, she's walked from Mexico to Canada. She's canoed the Missouri River from source to sea. And of course, she has cycled over 80,000 miles across North and South America, including the adventure that she's going to speak to us about. And the adventure that was chronicled in her book, Bicycling with Butterflies. Um, so we welcome her to share with us. I have to say her book has reserved, uh, has received a five-star rating on Amazon, and you will find articles about her, her book and her work in Orion Magazine and through different syndicated newspapers, including the Christian Science Monitor. She has done many presentations and has been featured on many podcasts, um, one of which was The Nature Guys, which is where I learned about her and her book, and another podcast called Good People, Cool Things. I think it certainly is an apt introduction to our speaker, Sarah Dykeman. Thank you. That was a, a wonderful introduction. Thank you so much. And thanks. Thanks for organizing this. Thanks everyone for coming out. So ba basically, um, for folks that don't know, I rode my bicycle following the monarch migration back in 2017. And I went from Mexico to Canada and back. And the, the kind of the point of the whole thing was one to learn about monarchs and have an adventure and two was to be their voice. And that mission to, to speak for the monarchs, speak on their behalf, speak for what they need to what they need um, continues and it's it's doing things like this. So I, I appreciate having an audience and I appreciate when people help spread the word. And I, I know if you guys are in the Audubon, you're already doing lots of great outreach and, and that's what we need is is we just need to tell everyone. <laughs> And I say, we can't all, we can't speak to everyone, but we can all speak to someone and eventually we will all know. So with that, I'm gonna pull up a little presentation to put flowers or flowers to put photos to the stories. And um, what I'll do, oops, here we go, is spend a little bit of time um, kind of introducing the monarch. It might be a little basic if you have questions, Put them in the chat and at the end we can dive into more detailed bits of ecology uh, at least to the best of my knowledge um, but i'll do a little intro on monarchs and then a little intro on bike touring and then kind of go from there so this is the monarch butterfly obviously and this is a male monarch because you can see he has on his hind wings here these these scent glands um, only the males have those and he is nectaring on a milkweed plant. And one of the things about the monarch is you cannot tell the story of the monarch without telling the story of milkweed. They are, they are tied together. The, the milkweed is the only food source of the monarch caterpillar. So the adult mo uh, monarchs are actually generalists. They'll nectar on all sorts of plants um, like this male is doing, but the caterpillars only eat milkweed. And as far as their ecology goes, I think a good place to start is their range map. And this range map, it might be kind of small on your screen, mostly just pay attention to the fact that there's four colors. The yellow is where the monarchs spend the summer months. The green is where they spend the, spend the spring. Orange is the fall. And then little tiny dots of blue are the, the winter range. And the, the overwinter, um, sometimes in Florida, if we have time at the end and folks are interested, I can speak to the monarchs in Florida. Um, there are monarchs in California and those monarchs have been making the news because a few, a, a few years ago, their population, their, at least their overwintering population had, had reached all time lows. It's possibly bounced back. It's a, a kind of interesting story going on out West, but then it's, but mostly from the Rocky Mountains to the Atlantic Ocean, all these monarchs overwinter in Mexico. 
And it's a pretty phenomenal site if, if you haven't seen photos. I have, a, I have a few later in the presentation of what, what that looks like. But I think it's important to understand the range. It's one of my favorite things about the monarch. If I had been trying to follow pretty much any other animal, they don't spread out like this. They don't offer the opportunity to, to go pretty much any, anywhere, <laughs> right? If I was, as long as I was in Texas in the spring, I was on the route of the monarch. As long as I was in Iowa in the summer, I was on the route of the monarch. So I was really able to adapt my route to as opportunities showed themselves and presented themselves and, and go pretty much everywhere. And, and I find the monarch to be just so democratic in that respect. They don't, they don't need just national parks. They don't need just the most wild lands. Like they're happy in a backyard if there's milkweed. And I, I think that's really wonderful. And I think that's why my trip could be successful because I could find a monarch in a, pretty much everywhere I went. Um, the only other thing I'd like to say about the ecology for now is that this is not one monarch making this whole trip. This is multi-generational. So depending on the climate, monarchs are cold-blooded. So their development depends on the environment which they're in but it takes between three to five generations to complete this entire loop. So the monarchs I started with were not the monarchs I finished with. Oops. As far as bike touring, this is, this is my route. That, is, that red line is a 10,201 mile line. I started in Michoacan, Mexico in mid-March and I went straight north up into the Midwest I hugged the Missouri River because I had a lot of contacts from my Missouri River trip. So I already had, knew some schools and teachers and, and folks in Sioux City and Council Bluffs. So I went where, where I already knew people. And then I curved over to the East Coast. And originally I had planned to go from New York City back to where my parents live in Kansas City, kind of a direct route. But folks in Southern Ontario kept saying, you gotta come, you gotta come, you gotta come here. And one of the reasons my route is so squiggly is because one of my philosophies is try and say yes. Say yes as much as possible. So every, pretty much every squiggle you see is because someone emailed me, found out about my trip, emailed me and said, hey, I'm a teacher at a school, I'd love for you to come. Or, hey, I work at a nature center, would you do a presentation? Or, hey, I'm growing monarchs in my backyard, I'd, I'd love to give you a place to stay. So I really did try and say yes. That's for the, that accounts for this big loop and it accounts for all these small ones as well. And I, let's see, I guess I should just mention too that on, my, on the fall migration, I, I was a little bit behind the monarchs. I, I still saw a lot of monarchs on the fall migration, but I didn't get back to the overwintering sites until the end of November. And, and typically the monarchs will leave in March and get back at the beginning of November. All right, so as far as bike touring is concerned, this is my setup. Um, you can see my bike is nothing special. It's actually a pretty old beat up bike that didn't cost much at all. And that's actually a good thing for bike touring in my opinion. One, it's super comfortable and two, I can leave it in front of a gas station or a grocery store and, and not worry too much about people wanting to steal it. So it's a little bit of theft prevention. And then you'll see on there that I have these bags so on the front, these are homemade bags, or excuse me, store-bought bags called panniers. And in there, there, I carried my sleeping pad, sleeping bag, computer, camera, kind of journal, book, the things that I really wanted to make sure never got wet. And then in the back, I had all my tools for minor bike repairs. You can see that red bag is my tent. The blue, the blue thing on there is actually a little camp chair. I gave presentations to kids at school and I'd always say, can you, who believes or who thinks that I have a sofa? And of course, no one raises their hand. And then I'd like whip out this the camp chair and be like, but I do. And then I'd have the kids sit on my chair. That was always a highlight. So I have a chair, but I'm, I, I carry more than necessary, but since it was nine months, I, I had some luxuries. I also, one of those back panniers had a stove and my cooking pot, my cooking set. And then I usually carry one or two days of food, depending on the route. If I knew I wasn't gonna see a grocery store for a few days, I might stock up. Um, but typically I could buy groceries about once a day. And what I love about this way of traveling is I'm so self-contained. I, I have everything I need. And because of that, I, I didn't need a, a very detailed plan. 
So that red route, a lot of it I made up on the spot on that day. I had a general idea of where I wanted to go and then I would just start going. And then I would meet someone at a gas station and they'd say, oh, I live down this road and I have a spare bed. And so then all of a sudden I'd be going there or they'd say, oh, this road is really awesome or you get the point. It was a lot of me just kind of going where opportunity presented. Um, and like I said, because I had everything I needed, I didn't feel that pressure of needing to get to a camp spot, needing to get to a, a specific spot every single night. So I basically, I just I ate when I was hungry. This is me cooking. I, I rarely cooked on the trip. I mostly just ate sandwiches because that's pretty lazy. But I'll get to why I, I also had a lot of home cooked meals, which made eating sandwiches for three or four days in a row more doable. But I'd also, because I was on, because I was self-contained, I got to just stop whenever I wanted. And this is just one of those examples. I could tell you a million stories of stopping for something interesting. I like this one because this little toad, this little American toad was on the road. And I guarantee if you were driving, you would not have seen this little toad. But when you're on a bike, you're going 10, about 10 miles an hour. You just, you get to see so much more and you get to stop. If you had seen this toad in a car, by the time you've decided, you've like registered what it was and then pulled over, found a safe spot, walked back, it's like, well, that, that creature's probably gone. Or you're just decided I'm, I'm too lazy, I'll keep moving. But on a bike, you're like, oh great, a reason to stop. And you just pull over and, and look. And this is kind of the heart of my trip. Like I was looking for monarchs all the time, but I, I knew when I left that I, I was going to encounter lots of other animals. And that's really uh, one of my favorite parts. In fact, since this is Audubon, my, probably my, one of my favorite encounters of the whole trip was um, seeing, I saw about four partial to like 90% white ravens in the, in the UP. It was amazing. It was so cool. But also in down in the Midwest, um, in southern the southern parts of the country, the slither tail flight catchers they they never got old. I just I'm like oh I feel like I'm in the jungle. <laughs> These guys belong in the jungle. They're so beautiful. But anyway, it was seeing all the other creatures that was a, a real motivation. Again, because I have everything I need, I had time to stop. I had time to kind of go where my curiosity went. And the other thing, because I had everything I needed, I was able to just camp wherever I wanted um, to, to an extent. So I never paid to camp. I, I did this, it's called stealth camping. It's just kind of finding a safe spot off the road where you're, you're out of sight. And often it was like hidden in plain sight out of sight. So here's my tent behind this bush. This is in Texas. And Texas just has no public land to camp on and lots and lots of fences. So I had to really, be creative where I camped in Texas there's the road right there but the this is actually it looks super sketchy and scary but I actually felt super safe on these I was asleep with the lights off by the time it got dark so no one could see me and even if they did like would you stop for the lady in the middle of nowhere in a tent in the woods in Texas probably not so I, I actually felt really safe I never had any scary encounters um, while I was camping like this. I did have a few scary encounters when I was camping in more public places. But this, this is how I camp most of the time. And what I love about this the most is like, it really bonded me to the experience of the monarch, right? Because the monarchs, they leave Mexico in the spring and they're traveling north. And every single day they have to find a new spot to sleep. And I have to imagine that some nights they find the perfect spot. They find everything they need. They've got shelter, they have nectar plants. They've, they've, they maybe have some milkweed if they're far enough north and it's perfect. And they're just probably just so relieved. And then there's nights where there's nothing. There's no habitat. And I felt that I've had to bike sometimes two or three extra hours looking for a spot. And I think as a traveler, I understand at, a, at a, a visceral level, why we need to have way stations, why we need to have habitat, not just preserved in Mexico, not just in Canada or, or their most northern part of the range, but everywhere in between. And every little spot um, can become a way station by just giving the monarchs what they need, giving them those nectar plants and, and the milkweed.
we'll talk about that more in a sec. Now, a lot of times people in this part of the presentation, they're like, yep, yeah, no, I'm not camping like that. But best reason to camp like that, so easy to clean your house. Just oh, my, my, my house is only clean when I'm camping. <laughs> Let's just say that. And another great reason is the people that you meet along the way. So I had so many roadside encounters and this particular one is one of my favorites because it involves ice cream. And I was in Mexico and I'd been biking just on this boring hot highway for quite a while. And I'm just like, just slogging through this, trying to try and to pass the time to make a turn to get to a road that's smaller and more exciting. And it's, it's over 100 degrees and boy, it just, it wasn't all that fun. And then I see this motorcycle and as the motorcyclist gets closer, he starts to slow down. And all of a sudden he's in front of me asking me if, if I want ice cream. And I'm like, the rule is say yes as much as possible and say yes, I mean, to an extent of feeling safe. But I said yes, and I remember that ice cream very well. I don't really remember the miles in between. And so it's so much about a bike touring is kind of seizing those opportunities, seizing those moments. And you can't predict them, but you, you can predict that something interesting will happen. Now, it wasn't just roadside ice cream. There was also lots of more planned ice cream moments. This is, uh, this is Margaret. She lives on a dairy farm in, in Ontario. And she, she, I knew her from like a friend of a friend. And she said, hey, I've got a farm. You want to come stay on my farm? And I said, yeah. And turns out she was a great cook. And so she fed me this ice cream. And I actually stayed with 68 families on my trip. And the reason I chose this picture of all of all of them is because I just, again, I love, I love this idea that the monarchs and I had this same shared experience. And in this, oops, in this case, in the foreground, Monar or Margaret is feeding um, me ice cream, which I'm loving. And in the background in her yard, who is she feeding but pollinators? And so again, I have this moment where I think, man, the monarchs and I arrived to the same places with relief and gratitude and happiness and everything we need. And I just think that's so, that's so brilliant and so wonderful that there's people that were taking care of me were the same taking care of the monarchs. And we both have the same people to thank, which I, I just really, I love. And the truth is we need people like Margaret. We need people to be planting these gardens because what I discovered along my trip and what you guys might already know is that the monarch's population is declining. And this is uh, the population from the early 90s to, to last year. Uh, they, count, they count them in the winter. And you don't need to read all the numbers again. What's important is actually just to kind of squint and see the trajectory, see that, that over time trend. And that over tr time trend line is going down, 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 and down is bad. All populations fluctuate year to year. It's totally natural and normal. The problem is that every year it's seeming like there's less and less. And what I, what I, I actually put this graph up because what I love is it has this little green dotted line. And that's, that's where scientists think that the monarch population needs to be to be sustainable. And you can see we're not there. And the, the reason for this in large part is due to habitat loss. And what I, I, the way I like to describe it is if, every, if half of the, the monarchs are female and each female is laying approximately 500 eggs she needs 500 milkweeds to plant to lay those 500 eggs. And if she doesn't, well, that means there's going to be less eggs, there's going to be less successful monarchs, and we're going to have less butterflies. So there's, I think, a campaign right now, or I don't remember the exact things right now, but it's, it's planning, I think it's either 1 billion stems of milkweed. It might, it might have changed, forgive me for not remembering that off the top of my head. But we need we need billions of of milkweed, billions. Like that's kind of a hard to wrap your mind around. Um, but it's also doable, and there's so much habitat. There's so many places that we can make this happen. And one of them I just saw every on every sing, single mile of my trip, which is along the roads. And and this is a little controversial because 
there there is and I have seen roadkill monarch mortality but for the sake of right now let me just tell you about um this 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 one photo I think it kind of articulates what happened a lot on my trip and so I'm biking down the road this is a staged photo but this is very much what would happen is I'd be biking and I'd spot a milkweed so here's a common milkweed in the foreground and then I'd start looking, I'd look, there's two signs of monarchs. There's either the leaves are chewed and they leave these little holes with this like the, with the white latex sap kind of dripping out of them or the caterpillar frass, or the caterpillar poo. So I'd start looking for those. And if I saw either, and then my brakes, I slam on my brakes, throw my bike down and start looking. And here is um, the, the monarch. In fact, I think I, yeah, there's the up close view of him, same monarch. I spotted this monarch while biking 10 miles an hour and I threw my bike down and I spent probably like 30 minutes in this little ditch getting to know all the plants and animals here. And this monarch, interestingly enough, this is their, their frass and this monarch was actually picking up his frass, swinging back and forth and then throwing it over the leaf. And I am have some, these are just totally my theories. I probably need to dive into the literature a little more but I imagine it was either to, just to keep things clean or also to get rid of sign that there's a caterpillar there. Because if I noticed the frass, which clued me into there being a caterpillar, I'm sure another predator could do the same. So very interesting. And that was just on the side of the road. Hundreds and hundreds of cars were passing this monarch and never noticing. And there's just so much life happening in these little areas. And so, I'd spend 30 minutes in this, at least 30 minutes, just getting to know all these little secrets, I called them. And then I'd get back on my bike and I'd see this. And it's heartbreaking. It's so heartbreaking to train your eyes to see the world like a monarch does, and then see what humans are doing to that world and recognize that <laughs> that was the monarch's home. That was the monarch's chance. And then it was just taken away and it's, there's just such little bits of land left that to take this just felt like a, a kick in the face. And it, it wasn't just on the side of the road, it was everywhere. It's seen these huge school lawns where we could have prairie, we could have these, these places where kids could explore and learn and get their hands dirty. And instead it's just green grass and the suburbs where so much green grass and farms that are monoculture and we no longer share. Just, it, it just, it was a lot of miles and a lot of, I, I grew quite angry on my trip. And people always think, wow, like you bike 10,000 miles, that must've been so hard. And honestly, biking, the biking was the easy part. It was the mental part of being alone on my bike and just having these reminders every single day that humans have forgotten how to share. And when I look at these pictures right now, I'm sure everyone watching has a green grass lawn or maybe not, <laughs> but um, I, I wanna make sure to, that I'm, I'm not saying we can't have any green grass, but I'm saying what we need is some green grass and then some native gardens. We need to learn to share. And right now I know that everyone's mowing their lawns and watering them and fertilizing them and raking the leaves and doing all these things that are kind of crazy if you, if you step back and think about it because they wanna be good neighbors. But what we need to remember is that we also have bird neighbors and frog neighbors and snake neighbors and butterfly neighbors, and we need to be good neighbors to them as well. And so my book, I think, is a reflection of that. It's about it's half about my anger and half about reminding us and half about me reminding myself that there is another way and that there are a lot of people doing things different. And my trip was about that. My trip was ab about reminding people that that we need milkweed everywhere and that we need to share. And so this is a, a roadside ditch again, and there's a little egg. Like I was saying, a female will lay 500 eggs. Most of them won't survive. That's okay, because if, if 495 are eaten, that's 495 meals that will eventually move through the food chain and feed the birds we love. But we need to have billions of milkweed in order to make that possible. And everyone has a role to play, right? So for a lot of people, their role is to plant milkweed, plant native plants, encourage the protection of what's left of our prairie. I don't own any land. So for me, I needed a different 
um, a different plan, and that was to use my voice. So like I said, on, on my trip, I talked to kids at schools, I gave presentations, I talked about 9,000 people, um, did lots and lots of interviews, and just wanted to remind people that we, we, share, we share our backyards with butterflies, and we have a responsibility to give, to give them what they need so that they can keep coming and keep bringing us joy and beauty and all, and all that. And I found people doing that. And that's, if I hadn't gone to these schools, if I hadn't met people that were part of the solution, I, I think I would have probably given up. But I consider, I consider the people that were doing something, being part of the solution, my medicine. And, and I wanna just talk about a few of those. The first was school gardens. If you live near a school, if you have a grandkid or a kid or a neighbor in school, and you have the energy and the time to start a school garden, it's so powerful. And this school garden didn't, it was just like this slope that used to be really hard to mow and the teacher fought and fought and was able to show showcase this little outdoor science garden. And now the whole school was involved and you know it was, it made the news. And we went out there one day and we just got lost in, in these few little plants and we found eggs and I'll never forget when a butterfly flew over our head and like one, one kid yelled, you know, ah, butterfly. And then all of us were yelling and it was so beautiful. This was in Omaha and like Omaha had, a. I was in the, this was like deep in the suburbs. And the fact that that monarch found this little yard, this little garden was just so remarkable and such a testament to like, doesn't matter where you live, just plant that milkweed and, and they'll find you. More medicine or folks like uh, Bill, he's a farmer in Texas. He actually grows native seed. So he started his career with Bermuda grass. And one day was in the, in the I think early or late in the 80s was like, what am I doing? And so he started transitioning to native and now he owns this incredible farm and they source seeds from all over the area and as well as grow seed. He had milkweed literally growing in rows. It was so amazing. I saw so many monarchs on his, on my tour that, well, not so many, but compared to other places, I saw quite a few. And um, just a, a really remarkable person doing things different. And that's what we need is, is new ways of, of thinking about how we make our money and how we use the land. And then of course there was medicine and just like these little moments. I, this was in Iowa, I'm not, I have no idea where, but it was just like this little section and there's two signs here that say, don't spray in little native prairie. And it's someone fought for that. Someone made that happen. And I don't know who they are to thank them, but like it, there's just all these little spots and these little spots add up. This is in Sioux City, Iowa, this is Diane. She fought and I actually don't know when, a while ago for the Sioux City Prairie. It's, it's, I think it's the largest remnant prairie in city limits, in a city limit. So incredible. I mean, it, was a, it was a really remarkable site and that wouldn't be there without her. And like, I mean, it's just, it's, it's so good to know that people are fighting because none of us can do all of it. But if everyone does a little something that adds up, that's important. And then there's the gardens at, at uh, people's houses. This is the Amy's garden in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And when I first got there, I was like, that's not very much milkweed, I don't know. But she was like, when I, well, by the time I got there, she was like, oh, I'd already, I've already seen 40 eggs on these milkweeds. I was like, wow, if only, even if only one of those survives, that's 500 eggs in the next generation. And if only a few of those survive, that's still thousands more eggs by the time the, the fall, fall comes around. So literally every garden matters. And I love the idea that like, maybe one of you have seen a monarch that exists entirely because of this garden or vice versa. I just think that's so wonderful. And I, I think it's so important to remember that what we're doing connects us to other people doing these, these same things. And then there's Nadia's garden, and this is in Columbia, Missouri, one of my favorite gardens. I, it's actually most of the garden isn't even in the picture. But what I love most about this garden is that you can see where the property, property line is, and you can see this common milkweed kind of creeping out into the neighbor's yard. And I, I asked Nadia about it, and she said, well, before the, the neighbors just mowed everything, but then they found out that without milkweed 
there are no monarchs. So now they mow around this little this little clump of milkweed. And I think, wow, that's that's so poetic, right? And if Nadia hadn't lived there, if Nadia hadn't been the example for that street, if Nadia wasn't there to showcase how beautiful native plants are, then her neighbors wouldn't have milkweed. And so you can literally see the milkweed spreading. You can literally see these ideas spreading. And we need we need people being the example so that the monarchs have a chance. And man, the monarchs have taught me so much. But what I what I love this is a picture of the monarchs in Mexico. And I've I've kind of said this over and over again. But if everyone does a little something, it adds up to something bigger than any of us. And one day I was in Mexico and I was looking and I was like wow, this is, this is the metaphor I've been looking for. So if you see on this, this branch here, it's a pretty small tree, but there's so many monarchs on these branches that the tree's bent. And I've actually seen, I've been in, I've spent four winters in, in Mexico, and I've, I've seen branches this big, not fall while I was there, but the next day, you know, they're covered in monarchs and the next day they've fallen. And it's been shown that the weight of the monarchs can add up to actually break these branches. And so I think, wow, these monarchs are showing us that all of them together can do big things. So we, if we all do a little, it, just like the monarchs, we can metaphorically bend branches. And then I, I have to take that, that metaphor one step farther, if you'll allow, which is, to, which is kind of on the, what, what, like what I'm doing of using my voice. And, this is the monarchs in the winter, or it's, yeah, in the winter, but when it, on a sunny day, they'll kind of erupt in the air and they'll all be flying around. And you can go to Mexico in the winter and actually close your eyes and hear thousands or millions of wings beating. And it's just this really beautiful humming sound. And I think, wow, if there's just one monarch in the forest, like you're not gonna hear that, I'm not gonna hear that, but thousands add up to something louder something beautiful. And so one voice out there talking about monarchs, that's going to get lost. But if all of us tell someone, if all of us remind our neighbors, if all of us share this around the dinner table, then, then that becomes a voice that is really hard to ignore. And it doesn't matter where you live. I've said this a few times. This is a butterfly I saw in New York City, all right? So like while everyone else was like taking pictures of, I don't know, buildings, I ran around this like little corner in Manhattan trying to take pictures of the butterfly. And wow, it's just such a great teacher teaching moment here, right? It doesn't matter where you live. This is just what's so wonderful about the monarchs. You can live in on a farm in Iowa or New York City. Either way, you can help monarchs by planting, by planting natives or plant, planting plants in general. And then I'm kind of I kind of have transitioned to, to to some of the things that I love most about monarchs, and this is actually medicine, just kind of these lessons that I've learned from them. And I think this is the the last and maybe one of the most important. And it might connect to your all's experience with birds in some ways. Is the monarchs are just such great guides. There's they're such great teachers. Everyone loves monarchs. They're so beautiful. How could you not? But what happens, and I've seen this happen myself. To, to all sorts of people is they they fall in love with monarchs and then they get deeper and deeper and they and they start wanting to learn about more and more and more and so they're like oh I want to learn about their caterpillars so you have to slow down you cannot drive to see a caterpillar be driving and you'll stop and you'll get on your hands and knees and you'll discover the caterpillars in the garden and then you'll get really good at that and you'll turn your attention to the other pollinators in the garden. These are tussock moths. They also eat milkweed. And then you'll start to notice the other insects in the garden. Or spiders aren't insects. The other, the other um, invertebrates in the garden. And you'll start to notice, wow, they're beautiful. Wow, look, they have like this, these hairs on them just like the milkweed does. And, and then you'll start to notice the other pollinators. And then you'll start to notice, oh, wow, this habitat's also shared with frogs. So I love frogs so much. They're my passion. But what I love is that the monarchs kind of invited us into this world. And then while we're here, we're realizing when we protect monarchs, we're protecting frogs. When we protect frogs, we're protecting birds and spiders and tussock moths. Like everything is connected. So if monarchs aren't your jam, then you pick another species. And whatever species calls to you that you love, go protect them. 
And in the process, you're gonna protect everyone. So you don't have to bike through Mexico to help the monarchs. Literally all you have to do, oh, sorry, or New York City, I forgot about, I forgot I put this in, or battle skunks in Canada. The skunk and I, we came to an understanding, luckily. You don't have to be on a bike tour to help the monarchs. You just have to plant a garden. And I guarantee if you, if you plant the garden, um, as I'm sure a lot of you already have and, and know that there's a whole adventure at waits. Like it is such an adventure to plant a garden. And, and if you do the, the true adventures, the monarchs and all of the other amazing creatures will, will come to you, which is such a gift. So I'm, I'm super happy that I am able to tell a little bit of these great adventure stories. Um, my website is beyondabook.org. If you want to see more photos, of course, my, my book is, is Bicycling with Butterflies if you want to read more. And I would love if we have time to answer a few questions and go from there. Thank you, Sarah. Okay. Um, those of you who want to drop questions in the chat, I can help facilitate that or unmute yourselves and just chime in if you'd like as well. Hearing nothing, I will ask a question. Being a selfish person uh, that does give some presentations to people, is there a, a, um, a, face, a, a PowerPoint or a group of slides that could be turned into a PowerPoint that we could have access to that we could sp help spread the word? Um, I'd, hap I'd happily share any, any photos that you need. <laughs> I don't have anything specific, um, but if, if there's photos I can use, I'm, I'm happy to give them. Or, and I know there's so, many, there's so much Monarch related material out there. Um, Monarch Joint Venture is one of my favorite nonprofits. They're out of Minnesota and they have just really, really great handouts and really crystal clear re or, um, information and science. Monarch Watch also has quite a bit of education material. And then the, another great one is Journey North. And Journey North is really fun because they are a, a tracking website and so people it's it's citizen science it's open source basically anyone can join up and then they can they can log on and record the first of whatever they've seen the first egg of the season the first monarch of the season um, and not just that they also do hummingbirds they do the first emerging milkweed and and you can see over the years I actually use my used the, their information to help plan my route, but you can see how from year to year things change and, and just how things fit together and how how, this, how everything kind of works. And it's, it's pretty amazing. And they ha also have really a, a lot of good education material and they have some really good slides and PowerPoints for educators. Good, thank you. Yeah. Sarah, I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of laws have the uh, Mexican government enacted to protect the forests where the monarchs are overwintering? Mm. Mexico and land is so interesting. So right now the monarchs are protected in this place called, most of them, most of the colonies, in a place called the Monarch Butterfly Biosphere Reserve. And it's essentially a national park, but in the United States in the 1800s, a lot of national parks were created, but what happened is the native people were kicked out of that land. And it was like, nope, this is a national park. No humans live here. In Mexico, that's not the case. And in fact, so the land where the monarchs are, the protected land, that's land where that people live on. And it's there's just like some really amazing Mexican uh, land history, but basically in the, this might be a little too much, but, in the early 1900s, the, there was a Mexican revolution and the government took all the, all the land and just redistributed it among landless peasants. And they created these ejidos. And then what happened in the 80s when the monarchs were discovered 
is the 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 ejidos with monarchs the, the government just said nope you can no longer cut down the trees and they were like wait but this is like literally the land that was provided to us to make a living so they were cutting the trees they were farming and they got really scared because it was like what are they going to do if this land is taken from them and so they just started cutting and cutting and cutting and the government was like oh wait this yeah, is a terrible I idea so they created um, a fund to pay people in exchange instead of cutting trees pay them um, through this this these funds this other income source so that that goes around the question the law is protect the forest but laws are just laws right they don't matter if people are hungry and there's a lot of really interesting things happening where some ajidos some people are profiting a lot and then other ajidos are jealous so they're coming in and, and maybe doing some illegal logging like the type of logging has changed a lot it's it's not these huge clear cuts as much anymore it's more it's smaller operations but those operations add up um, so it's it's kind of it's it's kind of a mess and it's kind of over my pay grade but um, it, in essence the law says the, the monarchs are protected in reality that's that's quite different what what needs to happen is less about laws and more about just creating opportunity. So if people have other work, if they have sustainable work, if they, I mean, all of my friends that live in Mexico, the men are gone 80% of the time working in cities. My, my friends that don't have kids go to the city and they do, um, the men do construction and the women do like house housework typically. And they want to have work there. They want to be able to live there and have their lives there. But right now, the the economy just isn't in a place where that can happen. And in, until that happens, the the monarchs are vulnerable. Long answer. I I really love the politics yes. of Mexico. <laughs> so Sarah, here's a question. You traveled through many different states. Is there some? Are there some states that are doing? some good things that are noticeable in terms of conservation, um, better than others that perhaps um, Iowa could um, borrow some practices from? I mean, everyone's doing something and or every state's doing something. And, and not, that might not be the state specifically, but the people in it are, are rising up. I will give a shout out to Missouri. They, they, I, I'm gonna mess up the numbers, but, and I don't remember when, but a while ago, and maybe if someone knows, jump in and interrupt me, please. They, there's a, um, a tax on, on, I think all outdoor stuff, um, hunting, I know too, any like hunting gear, boating gear, and this, there's a tax that goes to the conservation fund and they have an incredible conservation department and, really incredible literature, really incredible programming. I'm, I was, I'm always really impressed when I let's see what they've come up with. Um, so that's one of the things, it's all about funding, right? So if you can channel a little bit of money away or money somewhere, that's, that's gonna go a long way. But then I, th I think a lot of it too is just about creating a culture, right? And I, I think actually Iowa's done a really good job of creating a culture of, of birding and of looking for butterflies and of, of, of finding, wildness and places that people don't expect. I think that's so important for us to remember. There's there's wild creatures everywhere. We just need to look for them. I have a question about the um, schools you were at. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. yep, okay. Um, so what, you were in schools in Mexico and the United States both? Yeah. <laughs> I did a few presentations in, in Mexico, but mo mostly the United States and I okay. think Canada as well. What were the um, kids that were most curious about? What kind of questions came up the most, I guess? And I mean, you get a lot of them, but was there any kind of theme to the basic questions that kids were curious about? Kids ask the best questions. I, I, I can't speak to a theme. I can speak to, they're, they're the only ones brave enough to ask me where I went to the bathroom. That's like actually a pretty common question. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm like, they're all thinking it they're all wondering and one brave kid and everyone laughs but they're all like no please tell us we, we want to know so there I, I just love answering kids questions but um my my favorite favorite question i ever got from kid a kid was at the end of a presentation i write about this in my book actually is um 
I'm like packing up and this little, I forget, I think it was a little girl came up to me and they're looking at my stuff and me and they're pretty quiet. And I'm, you know, just like look over and smile and they go, is any of this real? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, it is. This is real. Like, I think so much is so much of school is curated and textbooked and fake and not applicable that, that it's like, oh, wait, you're actually doing this. Oh, oh, wow. OK, <laughs> so, yeah, great questions from kids. So in the chat, Anne um, has shared some experiences. She said when she was in high school, she rode three separate long distance bike trips that lasted about a month at each. They also carried their gear and camped. They weren't looking for monarchs, she said, per se, but um, she became hooked on nature. And she also works at one of the larger nurseries here in the Cedar Valley. And uh, so at her work, she says, she does see a lot of different monarchs and the tree frogs and salamanders. And she's very protective of those creatures. Um, unfortunately, the nursery uses some chemicals and stuff, but maybe, you know, through some education, Anne, you can perhaps kind of start changing minds, just like, you know, Sarah mentioned, give voice to these creatures and, uh, you know, share the importance of how very small changes can, can coalesce to make a real difference. So, well, Sarah, here's a question. Um, what was harder, riding a bicycle 10,000 plus miles or writing a book? <laughs> um. The, the, the writing of the book was much harder. <laughs> but I actually want to go, go back to, to your comment from Anne because, well, one, I, I love the fact that um, if you're exposed to nature, you love nature. And if we can get kids on bikes, if we can get kids looking at, at weird bugs on the side of the road or wherever, whatever park we can get them in, like that has long lasting effects, which is obvious. Probably all of you have a story like that. And then as far as the nursery, I, with all of the love in the world, call monarch people crazy. They are so passionate. <laughs> they are so devoted. They are just a, whir just a whirlwind. And they can, they can, we, I should say, we, we can change things quickly because if enough monarch people call nurseries and say, please, please, please provide at least native plants that haven't been um sprayed or haven't been there's a there's a, a um a chemical uh, it's it's a neonic have you guys heard of neonics yeah. neonicotoids neonicotoids yeah. Yeah, neonicotoids yeah excuse me um they're they coat the seeds and they're water soluble so when the seed as the seed grows they're actually the the, ne the neonicotoid is absorbed into the to the plant and it comes and it's, it becomes part of the plant's leaves. So if a caterpillar eats it, that's the end of the caterpillar. If it goes into the nectar, so pollinating animals also feel the effects. If we can not use these, that's obviously huge. So if everyone calls nurseries and says, hey, do you have neonicotoid free natives, especially milkweed, you see milkweed being sold and that's it's not the case and that's actually not helpful at all. Um, it's counterintuitive or counterproductive excuse me like they're going to hear that they they want to have in their nursery what people are going to buy and so if enough people tell them what they want then that's it that is how we're going to change so that could be on everyone's to-do list tomorrow don't tell them Ann called don't tell them Ann sent you <laughs> <laughs> but yeah thanks for the comment and the questions So you mentioned also about um, talking with people that were very passionate about rearing butterflies. Mm. So can you speak more about that? Yeah, so there's a phenomenon of people rearing monarchs and maybe some of you do, um, where they take eggs from, the nat from nature and they rear them either indoors or outdoors, just like um, away from potential predators. And I'm, definitely okay with this like I, th I think it's I think there's some really amazing things that come from this one is being able to see the the metamorphosis up close being able to watch a caterpillar become a chrysalis that's hard to find in the wild 
to invite a neighbor or a kid or a school or go to the library and show people that don't have this opportunity to see this this phenomenon and kind of invite them into the into the world. What I, I also see happening is it's becoming a contest for who can rear the most. And I just I like to remind people that we don't want to rear all the monarchs indoors. That rearing is not how we're going to save monarchs, right? If every female lays 500 eggs, we want 490 of those eggs to get eaten by spiders so that they can feed the frogs and the birds and the snakes. We, we want there to not be 100% success. And at the same time though, what we, we do, so instead of rearing indoors to save the monarchs, what we need to do is plant more milkweed because if there's, if there's 500 milkweeds, that's 500 chances. If there's only two milkweeds, that's only two chances for survival. So we really need to change the focus. Rearing is about educating ourselves about having that moment of intimacy with the monarch, but then saving them is about planting milkweed. And both are great, <laughs> but I think we need to remind ourselves that because humans, we want, we want to feel like the hero of the story. Like, yeah, we are the caretakers, but the milk, the milk, that's the milkweed's job. So we need to caretake for the milkweed, in my opinion. <laughs> Any other questions? I'll ask another question. Um, sometimes you see a lot of milkweeds in the ditches along gravel roads. Do you think that those milkweeds that get covered with all kinds of dust, um, does that have any effect on the caterpillars? Or, you know, sometimes they're just totally coated. Right. There, that's a, a good question. There's actually been some research done on the effects of roadside caterpillars um, rearing um, and not, not just dust, but also salt and toxins and all, and all the things associated with roads. It seems like the consensus is basically if there's, there's gonna be more monarchs in general. So in the end, maybe if, if, it's not, uh, if it's not the best, it's better than nothing. Um, but I, I think more needs to be done with that. And I mean, yeah, I, I think that there's, there's, there's probably a lot of, of issues with the roadside milkweeds, but that, that's some of the last habitat out there. If you go out and look in the world, it's like, this is the last. And there is um, some efforts to create a corridor on, the, on Interstate 35. And again, people are like, oh, but that's gonna cause more mortality. But I think the thought is if 20% are dying from road mortality, if the pie is bigger, then the mortality will be larger, but the survival will also be larger. So in the end, larger is better. But yeah, I, I think more research needs to be done. Something interesting that might be worth looking into if you're interested is um, also out of, of Minnesota. It's, it's actually a, a, a Monarch Joint Venture Project, I believe that's called the, the Monarch, I'm gonna get this wrong, Larval Monitoring Project. Um, and you can actually be a citizen scientist and go out and, and study larva in a certain, a certain area. There's criteria to see about predation and other survival things. And I'm, I'm wondering if they have something about distance from a road in their, 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 their program. I, I, I bet they do. I, I haven't done it. I'm, I'm always in California in the summer doing my field work, so I kind of miss out on the action. I just want to say one. Oh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, please do. Well, I just, I just want to thank you, Sarah, for saying that about um, that it was harder. <laughs> that the riding of the bicycle was not the hardest part, because I, I'm sure I'm not the only one. But man, I just, it, it feels good to know I'm not alone in feeling that what you felt because I'm just, and I feel you, <laughs> I'm totally with you, that we don't we just don't know how to share. And, and I mean, it's different for the Mexicans who ab absolutely have to have something, but when we're mowing the grass, it, it just hurts so bad. <laughs> yeah, it's easier to share pain. <laughs> so finding other people that care, just it like just takes the weight off. So yeah, you're not yeah. alone. I'm not Thank alone. <laughs> it can feel that way. 
especially when you're biking thousands of miles by yourself. But yeah, I think I think the reminder that 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 we're not alone is so important. And the monarch, man, what a gift the monarch gives us because the monarch has like created this incredible passionate group, like I've said. And if you need a a, a moment to vent, you can just go talk to them and feel empowered and safe for a moment in the in the pain of the world. So there were some comments in the chat about um, where to find seed for milkweed and um, Fontana um, Nature Center in Buchanan County actually has um, free seed and some native seed mixes as well. And um, Mary, I think it might be you, um, correct me if I'm wrong, um, that you are a trainer for the um, ML. MP citizens, citizen science program. So, um, and occasionally um, we will have um, other uh, milkweed seed because I think Ken Hire had gathered some um, and we had some for giveaway when we were meeting in person. So um, yeah, it's always good to look for um, those opportunities and um, does it germinate fairly easily? I know that sometimes there's ragbri um, riders that will um, throw out seed balls as they ride across the state too. So that's a fun idea. Oh, and Sandra um, Cabell, um, or Sandra Cabell is the Fontana trainer. So at, um, for the Monarch Citizen Science Project. Nice. So lots, a lot there. Um, the MLMP, that's the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project. Thank you whoever put that up and helped me okay. with the acronym to remember the name. Um, I don't know who that is, but you guys should talk to them about, about uh, <laughs> getting involved. And as far as seeds go, yeah, there's a lot of opportunity to find seeds if you're and there's even opportunities. There's Monarch Watch gives out free starts to school programs, um, lot, lots and lots of opportunities to get milkweed. The thing with the seeds is they need to be cold stratified, which means they need to go through winter, basically, which makes sense, right? It's like, okay, these seeds are adapted to a, a winter. So if you buy the seeds and then plant them in the garden in the spring, there's a good chance they, they, won't, they won't germinate. What you need to do is before spring happens, you need to either um, put them in the fridge, usually between a damp paper towel. They also need that moisture and give them and like basically trick them into thinking winter happened. Um, when I've done it, I've also after, after that period's up, I think it's about six weeks usually. And I also put them in a little sand and, and also kind of try and break that seed coat um, before I start them. The other thing is just putting them in the ground in the fall and letting winter be winter for them. Um, I've, I've heard, I think one of my, my favorite pieces of advice is just put them in little seed containers in the fall and then leave them outside and then they'll sprout and you'll know these are milkweed because they're in the little seed containers. I don't know what those are called. And then you can plant them around your yard when you're ready. And then the other other thing to remember with natives and with seeds is it's, it takes a few years for them to get established, right? The, the motto I've heard is they sleep, then they creep, then they leap. Sleep, creep, leap. So it, it, you have to kind of keep that in mind and not get disheartened when the first year they don't grow very much. And when the second year they don't grow very much, give them that third year. And what I like is the idea is plant, plant a few every year. And then by the third year, you'll kind of have that cycle. You'll be having new ones that you're waiting. You'll have other ones that are already leaping and you can kind of just keep adding and adding. You don't have to dig up the whole yard tomorrow. That will be good. <laughs> Sarah, uh, did you have other bike bikers or naturalists accompany you Why you just along the road show up and ride along with you for a day or two and have an opportunity I had a few, to visit yeah i had a few people join me for a mile or two i had a, a reporter join me for like 30 miles and he he, he biked so fast he didn't have weight on his bike and i <laughs> I never bike so hard trying to keep up, <laughs> um, but I was I was by myself and and so the the biking at least I was by myself all most of the time. 
How often did you have a flat tire? <laughs> I kept track. I didn't, I buy good tires. They're like touring tires. So they're real beefy, really thick. I think I only had two or three flats oh. on the whole trip. <laughs> yeah, they, they go, they last a long time. They start to get, they start to wear out and when they start to wear out, you see there's like a color, like a band, you know, as the, the black rubber fades away, it's kind of like the warning that you're getting low. But when yeah. I start to see the blue color, sometimes it's green, I'm like, oh, I've got seven or 8,000 more miles. But people would see that and they'd be like, you need new tires, here's 20 bucks. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so I kind of used it for my advantage to get a little bit of uh, donations on the road. Yeah. <laughs> Don't tell them I said that. I might is, add, there, is there a specific variety of milkweed that monarchs like better than the others? I've heard there are some varieties they don't particularly like. There's like a hundred North American species about, and they'll use about 70. Um, that's for all North America. I, I don't, I can't speak to Iowa exactly. If someone does, they can interrupt. There's like three or four species that are kind of the common ones there's um, swamp milkweed, which was that first photo I showed. Um, common milkweed is the one I have a million photos of. It's my favorite. The common um, spreads by rhizomes as well as by seed. So a lot of people are kind of scared of them, but that's why I love them because they're like the brave scouts. And then the other one is, is called butterfly weed. That's the common name. And butterfly weed is popular because it, it doesn't spread as much. But there's there I, I'm using common names. Sorry guys. <laughs> but there's also like there's world milk world and purple are also pretty common. Um, it depends on what people can get. I I recommend people. This is at least in the Midwest. Um, get a couple and and one will inevitably die and the other won't. And then you know which one likes your yard better. And you can you can try again a few times. But having a little bit of diversity and seeing what likes your soil type and your sunlight and all that can is, is my advice. I, I might earlier, add to the, go ahead. I mentioned earlier that I had a flight of monarchs in my tree a couple of years ago. I was able to take a video of it and it was really interesting to see them flying around. Yeah, I bet you had a lot of friends <clears throat> wanting to come visit. <laughs> That's fun. I might add to the discussion about about uh, seed, I, I had good luck um, buying some, if you don't mind spending a little bit of money, the plugs from uh, Prairie, Prairie Moon Nursery. And they came very well packed. And now is a good time to set orders for Prairie seed and um, plants for the spring when they'll, they'll send them out when it's the proper time to plant. But it's already established and, and those plants came up um, probably the um, milkweed, some better than some of the others that'll come up in time. So I planted uh, a short mount in my, in my front yard and planned it out with plugs and then spread seed in the winter time in November around to try to get a little bit more diversity, some other things, but, um, but that, that's a good way in the Prairie Moon Nursery. You can look them up and get a catalog. I just tossed some information about that nursery in the chat. So I've driven oh, okay. past there before. So it's a little bit outside of Winona, Minnesota. So terrific. And it is local ecotype for our region. Yeah. <clears throat> I watched a program on public television a while back about a, a village in Mexico that uh, is um, all excited about monarchs and working really hard to to maintain the population. They had a this carnival with all the children drawing pictures and things. And they, they mentioned in there that they were trying to grow crops that would not destroy the canopy. And as I recall, one of them was that they were growing coffee, starting to grow coffee. And the government was helping them to come up with crops that they could grow while maintaining the canopy and, and, and preserving the monarchs. But hmm. at least in one village. Yeah, that's interesting. The, so the monarchs 
in Mexico are a pr pretty high elevation. They're about 10,000 feet above sea level. And so it's, it's actually pretty cold. And my experience there has been that at least my friends all grow beans and corn mostly. Um, and the, the, the issue with that of course is erosion. And there is, there's been some really tragic landslides in the town of Angangueo and a few other spots that have, have taken lives because these hillsides that once had pure forests now have corn and that corn is plowed every year and just can't, it can't hold the soil. So another phenomenon that I've seen happen and is continuing to happen is that instead of growing just corn and beans, they're also, they're converting some of that land back to, to monoculture uh, timber. So it's it's just usually the pines that grow quick and then um, I'm, I'm not, I don't think monarchs are going to really be using them, but it is at least holding the soil and maintaining the climate and and being a little less less destructive and a little bit probably a little bit more sustainable and it's pulling the need for timber from the more old growth um, colonies to to these these younger tree for, forests. But yeah, I think innovation is so important and trying new things is so important and encouraging new economies is, is really important. Another interesting thing that's happening in Mexico is there's a, there's a scientist and he's actually collecting seeds from low elevations and then growing them in greenhouses and then transplanting those, those seeds to higher elevations with the hope that those, that those, the, 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 the low elevation trees are more heat and, and drought tolerant. And so as climate change continues to change the, the climate and the rainfall, then those trees will, will be able to be higher up in the mountain and, and be able to be already kind of adapted to that, those, new, those new climatic conditions. So yeah, lots, lots going on and we need, we need everyone trying everything. So yeah, I haven't heard about that, but I wouldn't be surprised or. In this program, they had a big meeting of all the men, mostly men anyway, and they were all talking about monarchs and stuff. And a guy got up, was really passionate about it. And, and then the village was going to work to, to preserve the monarchs. And I think they did have some nursery trees there that they were planting. There. And as I recall, they were broadleaf trees. But, uh, but yeah, was... what uh, the meeting you're describing reminds me. So I was mentioning the Ahilos, which is the, basically the land that was redistributed by the government. And when the government did that, they assigned the land to these ejidatarios. So they're basically like the, the people that hold the right to the land, to use the land, to work the land and to live on the land. And, and each family, is on, they were only, there was only men were entitled to this, this designation. And then they would pass the title on to someone in their family. But the, the issue with this, and I see these in, this, in these meetings is, if you have 10 kids, only one of them gets to be an ejidatario. And so only one of them is able to go to these meetings and, and benefit from the decisions being made by these ejidos. So it's, it's not really on topic to what you're saying, but again, it's, I'm thinking about these meetings, I'm thinking about Mexico and what, what it means. And we have to not just take care of the ejidos and the ejidatarios and listen to them in the meetings, but remember that there's a lot of people that don't even have that voice and we need to share and spread the spread the opportunity but yeah I, I I I don't know exactly what but it sounds like a good movie I want to see it <laughs> it was several months ago so I don't remember the name of mm -hmm. it or anything barely remember it at all because <laughs> well, I remember what I did yesterday either <laughs> So at the top of the um, program, Tom mentioned that um, our group is looking into a, a MODIS tower, which can, um, in fact, um, detect uh, migrating uh, monarchs that are tagged. So um, I know that there have been other, some tagging projects um, in the Cedar Valley. I think Fontana Park in Buchanan County has done that. I think there might have been um, a monarch tagging event at the uh, UNI's um, Prairie Center as well. Um, so so the, the tags don't hurt the butterflies? Most of the tags 
99% of the, the tagging that you hear about is a, is a sticker. And the, for, the, for the people doing the tagging, they assure us it doesn't hurt them because they, they find tagged butterflies very, very far from where they were tagged. So I think uh, scientists are often weighing the cost of science of studying an animal and obviously more weight on a migratory animal can't be good, but the contribution to science we've is is worth it, and it doesn't seem like the the tagging isn't creating barriers to survival. So it seems it seems all right, and and anyone can participate. Monarch Watch sells um, stickers. They have like a each sticker has like a code, and you tag only fall migrants. Um, you get the stickers and you put the tag on their wings in a special place in a special way and you record where you tagged them. And then in Mexico, Monarch Watch will actually pay people that find the tags of the monarchs. So often the monarchs will die. Lots and lots of monarchs die every winter from cold and predators. And um, the winter is when the population kind of crashes and then having five generations in the summer, it rebounds. But the, the guides will, are always on the lookout for these stickers and, the, and Monarch Watch will actually help give them a, a reward for finding them and then that can help us understand and some really amazing um, research has come out from those tagging programs one of my absolute favorite is that they've realized from tagging that the proportion of monarchs in each of the sanctuary they're not all going the same forest right there's one sanctuary called el rosario that's the biggest um, there's also two others that are pretty large and open to the public um, cerro pelon and sierra Cinqua. And what they've noticed is that regardless of where the monarch is tagged, about 85% about end up at El Rosario. I think it's 85%, I'm bad with remembering numbers, but a large majority. Um, it's not all the Kansas monarchs go to El Rosario and all the New York monarchs go to Sierra Cinqua. It's about equal ratios, wherever they're tagged, go to the same spots, which is just so mind blowing <laughs> and just, I mean, there's just so many, so much ecology of the monarch that is, is mind blowing. And if you really stop and think about it <laughs> for a minute, your brain hurts because it's like, this is a little insect. And there's just so many interesting things like the fact that a monarch born in, in New York and a monarch born in Minnesota have to go a different angle to get to this, this colony in the winter. And that, but their parents could have been the same animal and thus it's not something in their genes because the next generation is going to live in Texas and then the next generation is going to live in in Iowa so it's there's like there's just like this amazing there's just so much amazing science to be un understood and so many questions and ama just it's amazing they're amazing <laughs> thank you for that clarification I always kind of wondered about that um, so um just maybe uh, I wanted to share a comment in the chat for those that aren't reading the chat, but um, our volunteer for the Monarch Larval Monitoring Program indicates that over 12 years, um, they have found that common milkweed hosts the most eggs and cut caterpillars, butterfly milkweed gets the fewest. Um, however, they think that, of course, as Sarah mentioned, the diversity is better. You need at least 10 milkweed to qualify as a monarch way station. Um, very dense planting of milkweed tends to encourage more pests and predators. So adding nectarine plants is also important. So thank you for sharing those hints and that, um, that data that you've observed um, through your citizen science projects. So. Right. Yeah, or I uh, this oh, we can comment. I'll comment on this and then let people go. But comment the different milkweeds have different toxicity levels. So I didn't really talk about this at all. But one of the the way that the monarch is is protected as an adult is that as a caterpillar they eat they meet they eat milkweed which is toxic and they sequester those toxins in their bodies, rendering them toxic and and more protected from predators. And different species of milkweed have different toxicity levels. And females will often prefer more toxic milkweed and can, they, they use their feet and they have these little, um, like, I think they're called tarsals, correct me if I'm wrong, um, that they drum on the milkweed and actually cut the milkweed and then um, can basically smell 
the quality and condition of the milkweed, very, very amazing. Wow. But um, yeah, so different milkweeds have different toxicity levels. And I, I do, and common milkweed is really, is a, a valuable milkweed. It's, it's, an, it's interesting because it used to not be common. The reason common milkweed is common is because we plowed the, and disturbed the, the prairie. So it's a disturbance species. I think scientists believe that it was at one point confined just to like animal burrows. So places where animals had disturbed the soil and then the plow came and everywhere was disturbed. And before the, the advent of GMO corn, once the corn emerged and the milkweed emerged, the farmer couldn't spray because if they sprayed the milkweed, they'd kill the corn. And so milkweed and common milkweed was incredibly common with corn. And it was actually pretty amazing. The, the monarchs were doing really good, well because of this. And then GMO corn was invented. And so now the farmers grow corn that's resistant to that same um, herbicide. So they can actually kill all the milkweed while the, once the corn has emerged, which means just pretty much overnight, farmers adopted this, this type of corn and soybean and just wiped out all that common milkweed. Just, mm -hmm. I mean, within a few years it was gone. So returning to organic, returning to um, farming practices that share would, would be a huge contribution. And yeah, I mean, I could talk all about, I'm, yeah. think, I'm thinking about that, but I'll, <laughs> I'll leave it at that for now. Thanks for all those comments. They're very good. And, and 12 years of data, that's really amazing. That's ahead of the curve and super helpful. So good, good work there. Well, this has been incredibly interesting, and and we've sure enjoyed your presentation, Sarah, and and your passion, and I think we we share that as a group group here too, and uh, so thank thank you again, and wonderful, and I'm, I'm going to be looking up that book for sure. I think. Monarch, yeah, you the Monarch out. Watch is selling it, so yeah. you, and so and so is Monarch Joint Venture, and I'm sure the local the local library has it, and yeah. um, uh, local bookstores too. Yeah. So. Lot, lots thank of opportunity to support monarchs and spread the word. Yep, thank you so much. Uh, next month, we're, we're taking an interesting twist and we have an, uh, an artist mm. coming, uh, uh, Ronaldo Correa, he does, does uh, nature sculptures. And a number of us heard him at, uh, I think it was one of the Prairie Conferences or Day of Insects, one of those. Um, online conferences it was a really interesting program and so we're diverting a little bit from what we normally do but um but that's all good because we're all in, in this together and he has a, a a message to send as well so that will be february 8th the next tuesday the second tuesday in february and we hope to see you back um uh, the rest the rest of you and bring a friend or suggested and again our programs are archived for the last couple of years now it's been over two years now we've been doing zoom because of covid but those programs are there for you to, to watch on our gopras.org website at your leisure or to re-watch and re-watch again and you might send some people over to take a look at sarah's program and say hey, this is really great you got to hear about this so Thank you all for being here. And thank you again, Sarah, and for no. Candace for getting this arranged for us. Appreciate it. Definitely. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Great questions, great comments. It's always fun to uh, you know, share this evening with like-minded people. Could I quickly ask, where's Sarah at right now? Where's she live? Where is she at right now? Where? <laughs> uh, right now, I'm in Kansas City. Is that where you I, live? I, I, no, I'm visiting my parents after I went to Ecuador. I, I came here for a little bit and I'll, I'm headed back to California in a, in a little bit. So what do you plan to do on your next bike trip? <laughs> oh boy. I really, really want to do a, a, a something with frogs. I love frogs so oh, much. Good. Yeah. They have so many lessons to teach us. They're so um, and so inspiring and incredible, but just wait. I'm just waiting to be able to travel again. <laughs> so, see, my trip. I just like my trip would not have been possible. Like I stayed with so many people, and just like just thinking about how 
I'm just so grateful for that, being able to do that and not get caught in the middle or having to make a choice about what to do. And I'm, ugh, yeah, I'm what a mess, but yeah, it's been, it's been nice to not travel a lot and just bike close to home and yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't help but think years ago watching Charles Corral <laughs> on Sunday mornings as he traveled around the, the nation and he, he and uh, being an ambassador for uh, for the small communities, and I, I look at you similarly as an ambassador for wildlife, and then I encourage you to keep this up. Mm, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes I'm like, I think I'm a missionary. <laughs> <laughs> Just like going and spreading the the word. <laughs> yeah, but it's similar, but. Yeah, I, I, I feel lucky to have found a way to help the monarchs. And I'm, I'm actually writing a little blog right now for Monarch Joint Venture about just how I've, I feel like I'm realizing that the more I give to the monarch, the more mm. they give back to me. So like they gave me this adventure and I gave them my voice and then they gave me a book, which has now given me all these new opportunities. And I, I, there's no reason for me to stop because there's, they just keep giving me more. They give keep giving me more opportunity, more reason to keep going. And so here I am. As you get a little bit older, hopefully some of these young youth that you've talked to in the schools as you traveled, you're going to come across one of them where they're going to say, hey, I was in one of those classes. And that'll probably <clears throat> put a smile on your face too. Yeah, you know, it's funny because I think back and I, we had a, a guy, a photographer come to my elementary school and he talked about the Galapagos. And I remember being like, I want to go there. But <laughs> the, the only thing I remember, this is so bad, from the whole presentation is that he said the word um, booby when he said blue-footed booby. And I remember <laughs> we just all were like, ah! <laughs> I'm like, man, I need to work in that word in my presentation so the kids remember. <laughs> but I remember more in my heart than I do of actually what he said. <laughs> well, there's several of our members, okay. Tom, and I think Chris and Craig, don't you all have frog and toad surveys that you do? Oh, yeah. yeah. The state? Yeah. And so yeah. does Tom. And yeah. Tom, yeah. Yes, yeah, I know, because yes. I've got, been out with Tom, and that's super fun. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So we like right. frogs too, Sarah. Oh, man. <laughs> I love them. <laughs> They're so cool. Oh, uh, something to look up in one of your journals when you're talking to young children is we experience this as we talk with young kids here in Denver is the um, the butter butts. <laughs> and uh, that's a, what is that? The yellow rump warbler. Mm. And that's a little nickname for them, is butter butts, and that'll always that always get them kind of giggling and excited to listen. <laughs> to that. It's all right. That's all I need. That's <laughs> <laughs> that's that fifth grade body humor, you know. <laughs> you, you gotta appeal to your audience, right? <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, thank you again so much. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night. I remember Good night. that. Warbler. <laughs>